Creed. I know it's been a while, but we'll be continuing our studying to study tonight of this book. First John chapter three. We'll be going through verses eleven through nineteen, and we'll be talk about the Christian's way of love, and specifically on two sides of the spectrum, love versus hate. The text says, For this is the message that ye heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of the wicked one, and slew his brother, and wherefore slew he him, because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. We know that we have passed from death unto life, because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brethren abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso hath the world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him. How dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And hereby we know that we are of the truth, and we shall assure our hearts before him. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you once again for allowing us to assemble, Lord to worship and praise your name. Lord, help your name be glorified above all things today. Lord, help us to truly worship you and take your great gift of love, Lord, and help us as Christians to give it out in the world, a world that will hate us and persecute us, Lord. Help us to live your way and not the world's way. Lord, help us to keep rejecting the world and keep abiding in you. Lord, be with all of our sister churches and all of our missionaries, Lord. Flow through them and let the let the Spirit work amongst your people tonight. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. So we come back here to the book of First John today, and we're going to talk about one of the great vocal points of Christianity. We come to talk about a topic that is essential for every Christian. We talk about love. And again, we've talked about this before through this epistle, but love is the backbone of a Christian walk. And specifically today, we're going to be talking about the Christian's unbridled love. And we will look here in the text and see how Christians should be putting in a great labor in this action of love. We will look into the text and dive in and see more and more about it. And in doing so, we will again see this beautiful assurance God gives us in this love. But in order to have this assurance, we come here again today to see if we pass another one of John's tests for us. You've heard it all throughout this book, and we will keep hearing it as we move through this epistle. We will continue to read John's tests of assurance, assurance of eternal life. This is a crucial epistle for us to understand because we all need this assurance of eternal life. There is not someone here in this building that shouldn't want this insurance of eternal life because this is an important subject. We shall all want to be sure we're going to heaven, right? We shall all want to make sure we're with the Lord in paradise come that final day. And John, John right here is going to be giving us another test to see if this will apply to us, to see if we have eternal life. Again, it's the purpose of, of this epistle. And it's important purpose because the Bible ha has it in there for a reason, right? It's the Word of God. God wants us to have this assurance of eternal life, and God wants us to take the test. That's why He gives us this book. We need to make sure our election is 100%, and we need to be constantly examining our faith. And the test presented to us today by John is one of great importance to the modern day man and woman. This is one that contrasts love and hate. And you are going to see 
inwardly which side of the spectrum you are on. Now, we see the word love thrown, a lot, thrown around a lot today in modern society, but this term has often been diluted. The modern world claims every day about having love for someone. They say they love day in and day out. But the world's love is different from a Christian's love. The world's love is different from our love. And to pass John's test, you have to see which kind of love you have. The original love that John is going to be describing in this text. But on the contrasting side of this true love comes hate. A hate that comes from the devil himself. A hate that is in of his children, as we read in verse 10, it says, In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil, whosoever doth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. The children of the devil do not love, but they hate. And their hate will end in jealousy and murder. As we see, we are giving the example of Cain today. As we take this test, we will analyze both sides of the spectrum. And in doing so, we will see which side we are on. And then we will look at the nature of hate specifically and look at the nature of love. So going to verse 11, we are going to see how this is a staple of Christianity. How this is the foundation of it all. Why it is such an important building block for us. And being a foundational piece, being a building block, this is going to be nothing new. There isn't going to be a revelation here today. It's not new doctrine. It's foundational. It says in verse 11, For this is the message that ye heard from the beginning. That's the foundation. That we should love one another. So love is a core base of Christianity. Love isn't new to us. It shouldn't be unheard of to anybody here. And we've all probably heard about this understanding of love at some point. And we are going to get the assurance of our salvation tonight from a love that was given to us from the beginning. And this is a love that all Christians should practice. This is what Christ commanded his disciples to do in John 13, 34, when he says, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you that ye also love one another. Now we talked about in a previous sermon on love that, that this is a new commandment, but it's built upon the new old commandment as it was in the beginning. But we also know that love is such a strong foundational piece that it carries the two greatest commandments as Jesus says in the Gospel of Matthew. So John, he's bringing up this commandment of love and he's showing its importance as an, a foundational value for Christians. And he's showing how essential it is for Christians. And he is going to use it so you can assure your salvation. Now let's look at the verse again. So it says, For this is the message that ye heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Now, to stress the importance of this all the more, we see in verse 11 how he says that this is a message. And the word message is important. And it's important because he's saying it's not just banter. It's not just blowing smoke for everybody. This is important. And he gave us this important message so that we may receive it and live by it. We should live by this message, by this proclamation right here. And the proclamation is that we love one another. We all should have this love as Christians. God calls us to live by it and to act in it. But it's also important not to fall to the opposition of love. And that is hatred. It's important not to succumb to anger and hatred. And John will give us an example of that in our next verse. It says in verse 12, Not as Cain, who was of the wicked one, and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil, and his brother righteous. So John, he turns to talk about a Christians loving their brethren to go on to the opposite side. He turns to talk about brothers hating each other. 
And he actually uses an actual pair of brothers from the Old Testament as his example. He uses Cain and Abel. And we see, we hear Cain's name specifically. In fact, Cain's name is the only specific name in this epistle outside for God himself. And he is doing this to exemplify Cain's actions. He is bringing the story of Cain to our attention so that we can truly understand what true hatred is. Now let's think about Cain for a second. Cain was a murderer and a killer. Cain was a jealous and hateful man. He was jealous of his brother. And Cain, at this time, he never even saw murder before. But yet Cain, in his unbridled hatred, showed an action and killed Abel and showed where he spiritually was and who he works for. He, as the verse says, is for the devil, the wicked one. And Cain... Cain slayed Abel. And John asks us here in this epistle, why did this man slay his own brother? Did Cain slay Abel because of Abel's deeds? Was it through Abel's sin? Was it through Abel's wrongdoing? No. John gives us the reason for this horrible action that Cain committed. It was because Abel's actions were righteous and Cain's were evil. Cain saw Abel and how God saw him favorably. And in seeing that came jealousy. And in that jealousy came hate. And in that hate came murder. Let's read it again. Not as Cain who was of that wicked one and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? because his own works were evil and his brother righteous. Cain committed the sin of murder. And oftentimes we will put murder on a pedestal. We think of murder as the sin that reigns above all else. But we know other sins are just as graven as murder. Going to the book of Mark, chapter 7, verses 21 through 23, it says, or from within, out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these things come from within and defile the man. Jesus is telling here in Mark that murder is one sin amongst many. And they all come from the same stem. All of these sins come out of the heart of men and stem from hatred. All of them. This is pointing out that our hearts are deceitful and wicked, as it says in Jeremiah. And these things make the man unclean. And again, all these sins stem from hatred. And what does this tell us? It tells us that God himself, by his own definition, is telling us that hatred is just as bad as killing a man. Hatred is just as unlawful as murder itself. And hatred is a stem of evil. And brethren, if you allow hatred to manifest, you will sin against God and you find yourself in a guilty spot. You are in guilty shoes. But not only that, we know hatred will throw us down a spiral. Brother, hatred will manifest and it will cause you to do one of these many different things listed in Mark 7. As Christians, we should look at these things and see them and purge hatred and go to God for repentance because we understand how drastic it truly is. And if you're lost in the building tonight, you should go to God with a repentant heart and know that Jesus is the only way of forgiveness for that sin. Scripture says, Now as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother, and wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. We see the truth of Cain. 
we see the truth of Abel. Now John uses this to tie in what this means more to us Christians in today's world. He says, marvel not my brethren if the world hate you. John is using Cain and Abel to relate modern day Christians with the world we live in. Abel was righteous. Abel was found in favor of God. Just as we Christians are righteous through Christ, and we are in God's favor, as we read earlier in this chapter, we are the sons of God. Cain. Cain is evil. He is wicked. Cain's spiritual leader is the devil. As the world is evil and wicked, and the devil is the prince of the world. We must understand as Christians, the world hates us. This is not some new revelation. It's nothing you should be surprised of. The world, like Cain, is jealous of our favor with God. They're jealous. They hate how we act. And they will hate us personally. Just as Cain hated Abel. We must know hatred is the foundation of the world, as love is the foundation for Christians. We are polar opposites, but we must know, no matter how much hatred is expelled upon us, we are to not hate back. We are to not run to the world's cornerstone of hatred, but we are to succumb to the Lord's cornerstone of love, even when it's hardest. It's a great indication, as it says in verse 14. In verse 14, it says, We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. As we explained in verse 12, how hatred indicates that you are with the world. It shows us, verse 14 tells us that love will associate you with God. It shows us that we have crossed from the world side and we have joined God's family. We have became one of the adopted sons of God. And John here is going to have us analyze this in our lives. Analyze our love while living in a world that is constantly promoting hatred and sin. This is what John's test is for us today. This is the test of eternal life. Because the saints of God and the family of God will love. This is a surefire way to see if we pass from our death and trespasses and sin and we, we are on the blood of Jesus. We see this through our love of brethren. And John is laying out this example right here. And as I said before, this is a hard thing for a Christian. We see each other's faults a lot of time. We're a family. We see each other's faults. We see each other's sins. We're not perfect. We see our failures. I'm sure you guys have seen mine. So the tough question is, is how do we love someone when we can see their failures and sins? How do we love people who fail and we see them fail? How do we love someone when we can see all their shortcomings, when we know the sin of their past as well as the sin of the present? How do we love these people? How do we do this? How can we love people when we see them sin against our loving God? It's not by your own will. That's for sure. It's through God, through this Holy Spirit dwelling within you. That's what causes us to get this type of love. And why? Why do we do this love to one another? John just keeps emphasizing it so much. Why do we love like this? Well, first, it's because of what Christ did for us. But it's also because we need a constant reminder of the washing and the love Christ did for us. John teaches and emphasizes this love so much because this is the good meat. This is meat that we are all to eat. It's the prescription God prescribed the Christian to take. This is the love that 
separates the local New Testament church and makes it what it is. It's what makes Witten Place Baptist Church so special. Witten Place Baptist Church is special and it's been special for many years because we are a church that preaches, teaches, and practices this love. This love is strong and mighty. I see it through many different members here. I see it all the time. It's this love that John is talking about right here. It's a beautiful thing to see, to get this love. And we get this love not just through doctrine, but we get this love through Christ. Love is a food and God wants us to eat it day in and day out. And this love is a special type of love. This is an agape love. The strong love is what helps us to love even in a hard time, even when we know each other's faults. And it's what we receive from God himself. It says, we know that we have paths from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. The text makes it clear that those who can't love are still in a state of death. They have not found the spiritual life offered by Christ. It's important to know that if you are here today and you are avoided of spiritual love, you are avoided of spiritual life. That's what John is trying to get across today. Now, to be clear, I'm not saying that if you struggle with love, that you're void of spiritual life. I'm saying that if you're completely void of this love in your spirit, you are void of spiritual life. That's what John is testing us on. Struggling to love and not having love are two different things. Not having the love is where the issue is. Verse 15, it says, Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. John here is clarifying what murder is. And he is not going at the deed of murder itself, but he is saying that the deed of hatred is just as bad as it. It's just as sinful. Jesus said this on the Sermon on the Mount as well, right? Hatred starts in the heart. And if this hatred is in your heart, you are a murderer. You're a sinner. We all know what this answer is in this text. We all know hatred is wrong. We all know love is right. The difficulty comes to pra in practicing it. And in verse 12, Verse 13 says, Now as Cain, who was that of the wicked one, and slew his brother, and wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. Marvel not, my brethren, that the world hateth you. There's two verses. It's hard to practice love because the world hates you. They will do things to you. They will persecute you. They will be murderers of you. They will do everything in their power to try and make you hate. They will do anything to get you to hate like them. But the Scripture shows us that we are to stay true to love. Stay true no matter the circumstance. We have to keep toward love even when it's hard. And it's really hard. I know. I know from my personal self, as I'm sure from many here, when someone hates us, we just want to get back at them. We're like James and John. When someone hates you, you just want the wrath of God to come upon them. Right? We want God to reward them, but not with a blessing. It's the natural side of the human heart. It's the sinful side of it. Look at David. Look at all the Psalms where he was asking the Lord to take vengeance upon his enemies. If David succumbs to this, surely we do. Why? Because of our human heart, it is its sinful nature, and it reverts to it naturally. We want the Lord to take people out when they hate us. 
But as hard and easy as it is to want hatred amongst these people and we want God to do it, we must take the love of God and show love even when it's the hardest thing to do. And brother, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that if you show love when you want to hate, that the world will treat you better for it. Brothers and sisters, I'm not going to tell you that the world will show you love because you show it love. In fact, brethren, I'd go to say that they'll hate you more for it. And the more and more we love, the more hate will come upon you. And it will make it so much tougher to love. But brethren, with that hate and persecution that will continually increase in our Christian lives, we must keep loving. And brethren, even when it feels like it's getting harder and harder, we have to love. We just must know that through God, given the power, He gave us the power to prevail in love, no matter how much hatred will come upon you. Just as Jesus prevailed in love with that much hatred thrown upon Him. That is the power of God's love, my brethren. We are given that agape love when we are the sons of God. And we must display it when that hate is shown to us. That's the separating nature of Christianity. That's what separates us from other religions. That's what separates us from Muslims and others. Others that claim they have the same God as us. We love one another. It's huge. It separates us. And we do it, why? Because Jesus, he displayed that love for us. He displayed it in dying for our sins. We didn't deserve it, yet he gave it to us. He gave it to us while we were yet sinners. Verse 16, it says, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. What better way to show us how to love by the, citing the greatest form of love? But the question is, is how do we get to this stage of love? How do we come to the love of laying ourselves down for our brethren? How do we get here? Well, it's not possible, not without God, not without the Spirit dwelling within you. We cannot display the love of God without God himself. We need him to dwell in us to show that true agape love. That's why John is using this example in this examination. This is a great way of telling if you are saved. It's impossible for a lost person to have this love from God. You have to have God and it is a sign of a believer. The world will give you many forms or examples of love, but none of it is this true agape love. None of it is the love that God gave to his elect. A godly form of love that only Christians have. It says in verse 17, but whosoever hath this world's good and seeth his brother have need and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelt the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. We must be more than a bag of words. We must be more than talk. What good are words if we don't act upon them? We are called that if we see someone in need, someone who needs compassion in their life, we are to provide with love. It's been taught. Our faith will have action to follow it. As Christians, love should be evident within us. As James said, faith without works is dead. This is what we are called to do by God himself. Then verse 19, and hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. John is telling us that we should all know this. This is the assurance I keep talking about of our eternal life. This is the focus of the epistle. 
that we could take this test from John and look at our love and know if we are of God and and his adopted children, and we have this beautiful eternal life. This is confidence given to us by God. This is the blessed assurance we sing about. This is knowing that Jesus is our personal Savior. Concluding, do we have this blessed assurance? Do we have it? Are we sure of our salvation? Do we have this agape love? This love given from heaven above. But the other question is, are we practicing that love? Because it's hard in a world of hate. And brethren, when experiencing this hatred, I encourage you to run to this text. It reminds us the commands from God and how we are to rise above. And folks, if you see hatred in your life and you're void of this agape love, It doesn't have to be the end. Death does not have to be upon you. God, through agape love, offered a way, a way of forgiveness, to place your faith in Jesus with all your heart, to declare him the Lord of your life, and to turn from your hate. It's because God offered this agape love for you. And when you accept it, you will turn and give it to others. And folks, We're not done with this topic. This epistle goes to it again. It will come up again. It will be preached again. So until we get to this point, we need to keep focusing on this in our lives. As basic as it might seem, it is all the most important. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you once again for coming here today, Lord, and Lord, we thank you for showing us that great agape love through your Son on the cross. And Lord, we are thankful, Lord, and help us to get taken that love, Lord, and expound it upon others. Lord, give us grace when we are hated upon. Lord, we know it's not easy, and we know it's in our nature to just dislike and get back, but Lord, we have to rise above, and we know that we do it through you abiding in us. Lord, keep abiding in us, Lord, and bless us as we go into the week, Lord. Help us to be great examples for you. Help us to give your word. Help us to be faithful stewards of it as these times come. And Lord, be at the Winton Place Baptist Church. Lord, be with us as we grow. Be with us as we labor for you. Lord, bless us upon all things. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.